Tonight, the real people. We had a pretty large bank associated with the uh, crossword warning app. The real pictures. And there's one old fireless picture of The real story. The real The real story of Apollo 13. It's a story of icy calm in the face of death. The odds were very small that we're going to get out of this alive. Of absolute refusal to admit defeat. We will never surrender. We will never give up crew. Of hope against all odds. I just knew he'd come back. An ordeal that lasted less than six days, but still echoes decades later. Every time a spacecraft splits the heavens and lift off. April 1970, America was convulsed over the Vietnam War. Airport was the big hit in theaters, and the news on April 10th that the Beatles were breaking up far overshadowed the moon mission scheduled the next day. As a matter of fact, before we took off, I think the only mention of Apollo 13 on the New York Times was on the weather page, about 97 pages in. Mission Commander Jim Lovell was one of NASA's most experienced astronauts. He'd been a backup pilot for the first moon landing in July of 69. That's one small step for man. Apollo 11 had transfixed the world, but then came Apollo 12, and now 13. Moon shots had come to seem routine. So you weren't front page news. Did that bother you at all? No, because this is what I wanted to do. Apollo 13 would bring back rock and soil samples from a hilly region of the moon, a much trickier landing site than those of previous missions. Lovell's fellow astronauts, Jack Swigert and Fred Hayes, were both on their first space flight. Just the thought of going to the moon was just so in incredible that uh, I couldn't pass up the chance. As Hayes and the others tell it today, none of them gave a moment's thought to the one thing about the mission that did catch the average person's attention. A lot of people just don't even deal with the number 13. They don't want to talk about it. Did it register with you at all? It didn't. I didn't even think about the number being superstitious. That is not true with my wife. My wife Marilyn said, why 13? It did bother me, yes. And I said, well, what happened to 14? But unlike an elevator, NASA didn't skip 13. Superstition uh, can't have any place. As if to drive home the point, lead flight director Gene Krantz recalls that NASA scheduled Apollo 13's launch for 1.13 p.m., or in military time, 1313. You were kind of flaunting the fact that you didn't care about superstition. I think uh, every person that was in this room uh, lived to, uh, to flaunt the odds. We were working on the ragged edge of all knowledge, all technology, and all experience in this room. This room was Kranz's domain, mission control in Houston. It had the, uh, the smell of the, uh, the cigarette smoke. I mean, we all smoked very heavily, pipes, cigars, cigarettes coffee pot that had been boiled over and had burned out. Krantz oversaw a 24-7 team of young engineers who controlled every aspect of space flight, the astronauts' lives in their hands. You guys had to look around at each other and think, we're, we're kind of a group of badasses in here. <laughs> I mean, you had to feel pretty good about yourselves. Well, the culture of this room was literally miraculous. It seemed that whatever happened, we were better as a total team than the sum of the parts. The same, of course, could be said for the three men riding the rocket, all of them former test pilots for whom mortal danger was just part of the job. When you became an astronaut, did you feel special? Did you feel invincible at all? I didn't feel invincible. I mean, the rewards involved overcame the risk that was involved. For families at home, a different equation. Did you ever get used to the risk involved, Marilyn? No, you put it out of your mind, but I can't say that um, it was easy at times. So on the day before launch, you're out at a beach house mm -hmm. and get ready to see your husband for the last time before he heads into space. And something strange happened with your wedding ring. What happened? Well, I was taking a shower and I, it just slipped right off my hand and it went into the drain. And I just was terrified because to me it was like an omen that something really was going to happen. It shook you up. Oh, it did shake me up. Did you ever tell Jim about it before the flight? Uh, no, oh no. You would never let that thought enter his mind before he's about oh, no. to jump on no, that no. rocket. No, uh, for some reason or other, the astronaut wives just never discussed anything that, that would uh, worry their husbands. Um, 
before they went on the flight. I mean, we kept everything to ourselves. Several hours before launch, and you guys get in that elevator that takes you for the ride alongside of and then eventually to the top of the Saturn rocket. That, that's a long elevator ride up. It's 337 feet. Uh, just the crew, three of us, and a couple nervous checkout people are getting us into the spacecraft. Because it's basically a huge bomb that you're, you're riding up alongside. Five and a half million pounds of high explosives in the form of oxygen, hydrogen, and everything else. Any jitters? No, it's too late for jitters at that time. Suddenly they say, you know, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And those engines go and you're on your way. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. Well, a liftoff, most people think it would be a big kick in the pants. It starts off very slowly because the vehicle weighs so much even though it has a five engines running. Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust, and it has cleared the tower. That's when you have your head close to the abort switch in case anything really goes wrong. And something did go wrong. One of the engines in the second stage of the rocket shut down prematurely, forcing mission control to make a series of quick calculations. Are the remaining engines all go? Do we have enough uh, propellant? Uh, to get the crew up into orbit. But within seconds, mission controllers determined that despite the malfunction, Apollo 13 was good to go for the moon. And I looked at my companions and I said, you know, every flight has a crisis. Something always goes wrong. This happened early in the flight and we're now free and clear of any other things going wrong. And he was right for about 55 hours. On April 11, 1970, two hours and 35 minutes after liftoff, Apollo 13 fired its rockets, accelerated to 24,000 miles an hour, and left Earth's orbit bound for the moon. And people always say, Jim, they say, into the calm and the peace of outer space. Outer space is a pretty hostile environment, isn't it? Well, it is. Uh, you have to be prepared for it. Outside was a complete vacuum. If the ship's hull failed, the crew would die in seconds. If the power failed, they'd freeze to death in hours. Everything they needed to survive, air, water, food, and fuel, had to be carefully managed. Even when things are going smoothly, it's a high-stress environment, isn't it? Oh, definitely. I, but you know, I think the whole program in those days is sort of a high-stress environment. It certainly was on the ground, in the pressure cooker that was mission control watching and listening to your crew die is something that will impress that event upon your mind forever. Gene Krantz had been a flight director when just three years earlier Apollo 1 caught fire on the launch pad incinerating astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chafee. Soon after Krantz helped write a document called Foundations of Mission Control. I'm gonna read you a passage from it. It says quote suddenly and unexpectedly we may find ourselves in a role where our performance has ultimate consequences. The work in this room is final. The decisions are final. The team in this room must be prepared not only to make those decisions, but to live with the results that occur. But the first two days of Apollo 13's mission hardly seemed like life or death. Spacecraft's in real good shape as far as we're concerned, Jim. We're bored to tears down here. The spacecraft had three parts. The cone-shaped command module was where all three men would ride for most of the trip to the moon and then back to Earth. The spidery lunar module, or LEM, would carry two astronauts to the lunar surface, then be left behind. The last critical piece was the service module, which contained the main engine and oxygen tanks. 13 Houston, we got a groovy TV picture. 55 hours and 11 minutes into the mission, Apollo 13's crew made time for an important duty, public relations. They beamed back a live TV show to Earth, something NASA liked to do, so taxpayers could see what they were up to. Fred Hayes was the uh, actor in this whole thing. Went in the lunar module and he opened up the bed that he was going to sleep on, sort of a hammock. And he tried to show people how he was going to sleep on this bed. Of course, he's zero gravity, so he kept bouncing up and down. It's kind of difficult here, uh, Jack, uh, getting into a hammock at zero G. A lighthearted look at life in space. 
It doesn't work too well up in space. You can't call me hair up there. Great show, except... No one was watching it. Explain why that was. One network had Dick Cavett, a live show. I think a second network had a rerun of Lucy. And the third network, at least in the city of Houston, Texas, the baseball game was going on. And everybody was watching that, including the people at the control center. Here we had been to the moon twice. And in some ways, ho-hum had set in. Complacency. Jim's wife Marilyn and daughters Barbara and Susan did watch the show in a private viewing room at Mission Control. And when you found out that not one of the networks carried that broadcast, how did it make you feel? Pretty bad. It did upset me, yes. But they got to see something the rest of the world didn't, an example of Fred Hayes's unusual sense of humor. You pulled something during that event that kind of got everyone's attention, and Jim Lovell commented on it. Talk to me about it. There is a valve in the limb, the repress valve, that when cycled does make a fairly pronounced uh, bang. Hayes turned the valve on live TV, and the bang startled Commander Jim Lovell. Every time he does that, our heart, our heart jump in our mouth. He throws it and it gives a big bang, you know. And then Inside the spacecraft, inside you hear the this spacecraft. bang. So every we look and say, oh, that's Hayes again. No harm done. This is the crew of Apollo 13. We it was after the broadcast, Jim, that, that Mission Control radios up, and they, and they asked you to do something as the crew that was fairly routine, involving one of the liquid oxygen tanks. Two tanks of supercooled liquid oxygen were the ship's most precious resource, providing both air and fuel. To get accurate readings from the tanks, Mission Controllers had to make sure the liquid didn't settle at the bottom. What did they ask you to do? It's sort of like a mush, this liquid oxygen. And so there's a fan down at the bottom of inside the tank and a little heater system. And so the question was, would you turn on the, the, the fan and the heater system and stir up the oxygen? And to accomplish that inside the spacecraft, what did you have to do, actually? Just flip a switch? Merely flip the switch. They were about 200,000 miles from Earth when Jack Swiger flipped the switch. The date, by the way, was April 13th. We make it there, uh, stir up your cryo tanks. Standby. Seconds later, the men of Apollo 13 were fighting for their lives. All right, Houston, we've had a problem. At precisely 55 hours, 53 minutes, and 18 seconds into the flight of Apollo 13, astronaut Jack Swigert followed Mission Control's instruction to flip the switch that stirred the liquid oxygen tanks. Everything seemed normal. And then... It just had a big bang at one time. And so we all looked around. What happened? What's that? I looked up at Fred Hayes to see if he knew what was going on. Remember, Hayes liked to play tricks with a pressure valve. Immediately, Jim Lovell looks over to see, has Fred Hayes pulled another fast one on me? I'm sure he saw it in my eyes, and he saw I wasn't smiling. And I could tell from his expression, he had no idea. So this wasn't one of his practical jokes with the pressure. He had no idea. Hayes was in the tunnel between the command module and the lunar module. I heard a loud bang and uh, metallic sounds because the way the, uh, the vehicle contorted, it actually twisted enough in the tunnel area that it crinkled a metal. You could hear that metal crinkling. Did your heart jump up into your throat? I mean... That's, that's, that's not a sound you want to hear 200,000 miles from home. A absolutely, and I knew it right away was not, not a normal circumstance. Jack Swigert radioed Mission Control. Hey, Houston, we've had a problem, yeah? Can say again, please. Fifteen seconds later, Lovell repeated the message. Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. I listened to that radio transmission that is probably as famous as the flight itself. Those five words, Houston... We've had a problem. And I listened to the calm in your voice. Were you as calm as you sound? I kind of think so. I mean, I was faced with a problem. And so if I did nothing but, you know, uh, you know, bounce off the walls for 10 minutes, I'd be right back to where that problem was. Things were not so calm in mission control. As soon as we received this call, it seemed our data just went wild. It was screwy. And for about 60 seconds, it was literally chaos in this room. In those 60 seconds, it seemed that every controller at every console 
saw a problem with Apollo 13. A flight, we've had a computer restart. The other controller says main bus center, the third one says antenna switch. It did not seem possible for so many things to go wrong at the same time. They thought it had to be a fault in their communications or their monitoring systems, not the spacecraft itself. We may have had an instrumentation problem flying. I immediately thought, okay, it's a minor electrical problem. We'll work this when the shift's over. The astronauts knew it was much worse than that. They thought they'd been hit by a meteor. Fred Hayes called mission control 50 seconds into the crisis. We had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, warning now. In the first few minutes, there was uh, absolute disbelief. The controllers had never come face to face with a real problem that we didn't have any immediate answers for. Crucial minutes ticked by. Jim Lovell stared at his instrument paddle. One oxygen tank gauge, the quantity gauge, read zero. And the other one, I could see the needle start to go down ever so slightly. And that's when I drifted over and looked out the side window. And I saw escaping at a high rate of speed a gaseous substance from the rear of my spacecraft. The crisis was now in minute 14. Uh, look at me looking out the uh, hatch that we are bending something. We are, uh, we are bending something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. Jim, this isn't like getting a blowout of your tire on a highway. You are 200,000 miles into outer space, drifting further and further away from Earth. What's your emotion at that moment? Well, I'll tell you the very first thing that I thought of. Why didn't this happen on Apollo 12, or why didn't it wait for Apollo 14? For a guy from Okay, can you tell us anything about the venting? Uh, okay. Where it's coming from? Coming out of window one right now. Do the astronauts seem abnormally calm? Cran says there's a reason. This is why we flew experimental test pilots in the spacecraft. Their demeanor was such, when you listen to these reports and get the reporting that's coming in, they're just reporting a uh, situation on board the spacecraft. But everyone who heard Lovell's report instantly knew what it meant. We had an explosion with an enormous amount of corollary damage. In fact, they came to learn Apollo 13 had suffered a catastrophic failure. There was faulty wiring inside liquid oxygen tank two. When Jack Swigert stirred the tank, a spark started a fire, fueled by pure oxygen. The tank blew up, taking out the ship's main supplies of air and power. I realized the gas escaping and the needle on my second and last tank, the quantity gauge, was one of the same, and shortly we'd be completely out of oxygen. Completely out of oxygen, speeding away from Earth at 2,000 miles per hour. I think every controller at that time recognized we're not going to the moon, but also it's going to be tough, damn tough, to get the crew of Apollo 13 home. The odds were very small at that time among ourselves that we're going to get out of this alive. The night of April 13th, Marilyn Lovell and her daughters returned home from Mission Control, where just minutes earlier they'd watched Jim and his crew on TV from outer space. Friends dropped in, astronaut Pete Conrad and his wife. And the phone rang. It was another friend who worked for NASA. And he said, oh, Marilyn, I just want you to know that uh, all these different countries have offered to help, you know, in the recovery and whatever. I couldn't understand what he was talking about, and I said, Jerry... I said, have you been drinking? She no sooner hung up than another phone, a direct line to NASA, started ringing. And immediately Pete came out, and I can still see him standing across the room from me with eyes as large as saucers. And he said, Marilyn, we have to talk. He filled her in. They turned on the TV. Apollo 13, once the forgotten moon flight, suddenly the biggest story on Earth. Apollo 13, its power source is badly damaged, its mission to the moon ended, its astronauts under a strain more severe than any others have yet endured. The, the ship was oxygen, crippled, leaking oxygen, the mission to the moon over. The three astronauts, one of them her husband, were probably doomed. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing, and at that moment the house was just filling with people. People didn't know what to say to me. Best friends, they couldn't say anything. And says Jim Lovell, 
he and Mission Control were not sure what to say to each other either. Well, from an emotional point of view, Matt, first of all, they didn't want to say to us, you have a real problem here. And we didn't want to say to them, I think we got a real problem. I mean, we knew that. But is that just the bravado of a test pilot and astronaut? No, it's, I, I think it's the case, hey, we're beyond that now. We have a, we have a problem. How do we get out of this problem? What, what do we do? We don't know yet or just what the steps are to do that. But Gene Krantz knew they all had to start making some decisions, and fast. I was a fighter pilot. Fighter pilots in my time used the words looking into the eye of a tiger. And this was the feeling I had when I recognized we were in survival mode and we had to kick in and get going as a team to help this crew out. The first problem, oxygen. The command module was going to run out in a matter of minutes. They had to figure out a way to save Lovell, Hayes, and Swigert fast. The only option was one they'd played out in simulations, but never expected to do. Now they start looking at the lunar module. Did you ever think you'd have to use that module as a lifeboat? Never thought I'd have to use it as a lifeboat. The lunar module, the spidery looking craft they'd planned to land on the moon and then leave behind. It had its own supply of air, water, and battery power. The lunar module was so fragile, you could punch a hole through the skin in it. But we had to live off of it because it had oxygen. What the lunar module could not do was re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. It could not get them home. So even though the command module was crippled, they had to save whatever air and power it had left. The only thing in the command module was a little battery and a little oxygen tank for the final plunge through the Earth's atmosphere. Jack Swiker was the command module pilot. I said, Jack, you power down this command module, save what you can. We're going into the lunar module, power it up. And so basically, you're, you're, you're buying time. You're, you're stalling for time in that lunar module so you can get back to that command module for that precise moment you need it to get back into the Earth's atmosphere. Oh, that's right. The command module was the only thing that had a heat shield. One hour now into the crisis, it was a race. Power down the command module before its batteries ran out. Power up the lunar module before oxygen ran out. They'd all trained for years, but never for this. I knew the command module had only so much life left, and we we very quickly had to get to a point in the startup of the lunar module before the command module completely died. The command module's computers contained critical data the crew had to transfer to the LEMS computers, fast. And they had to do it the old-fashioned way. So when people look at their BlackBerry today or their iPhone, they're holding something in their hand that has far more computing capabilities than the spacecraft you were flying in outer space with. Oh, yes. Jack Swigert called me all the numbers, and I wrote them down, and then we had a, a conversion table for the lunar module, and I did the arithmetic to get the new numbers, and then I called Mission Control. I said, would you check my, uh, my uh, arithmetic for me, please, to make sure I'm not making You're a mistake? You're afraid to make a mistake here, well, I, a mistake gonna, will cost you your life. That's right. I'm using all the assets I have, and that included the control center. They got into the lunar module with moments to spare, but now another decision loomed how to get back to Earth. I had a very fundamental decision I had to make. Uh, we could execute what we call a direct abort and come around the front side of the moon and be home in a day and a half. It was the quickest way home, but it would mean using the main engine, the one nearest the explosion. What if that engine failed or blew up as well? If this maneuver isn't executed perfectly, you're going to impact the moon. If the spacecraft would actually go right into the surface of the moon? Yeah, yeah. Kranz didn't want to take the risk. The other option, I'd have to go completely around the moon, take between four and five days to get back home. The problem with that was obvious to the astronauts themselves. When we started going to the lunar module, I realized it was designed for two guys for two days, and I counted the crew, one, two, three guys for four days. Simple arithmetic that meant they could run out of air, power, and water long before reaching Earth. In the end, it was the flight director's decision. And it was purely in a gut feeling that says, go around the moon, take your chances, trust your team to find the answers. In other words, take the long way home and risk losing their crew in space. Here in Mission Control, we're now looking towards an alternate mission. 
Five and a half hours after an explosion crippled their spaceship, the crew of Apollo 13 was riding in a lifeboat. Three men in a lunar module meant for two. The LEM was designed to carry them just 60 miles from lunar orbit to the surface. Now they had to use the LEM's rocket in a way its designers never intended, to steer them around the moon and set their course for Earth, a quarter million miles away. Did you ever have any doubts about whether you could accomplish it? Well, naturally, I think everybody does uh, in a situation like this. They had a tiny margin for error and no second chances. It's not just dying, Jim. It's the kind of death. It's, and I've thought about this, it's running out of oxygen and drifting in space perhaps forever. How did you deal with those thoughts? Oh, we didn't think about what the final results would be if we weren't successful. What would finally get to us? Running out of uh, all kinds of electrical power? Getting onto an orbit that we couldn't correct? And be in an orbit around the Earth for hundreds of years? You left one out. You could come in too steep into the Earth's atmosphere and burn up. I would have rather have done that. We now show a velocity of 3,210 feet per second. Did you allow yourselves to have those emotional discussions? Did anybody start talking about family? And what if? What if we don't make it back? To ourselves, we thought about family, not to each other. You didn't bring that up? We, no, uh, we did not bring that up. Uh, and we, we did not because we did not want to get emotionally d- uh, disturbed or challenged from the job that we had to do. But for the families, there was no other job. You wanted life to go on as normal, but in your heart, it couldn't have been anything close to normal. No, friends of mine told me that I was in a daze, really. The house was packed, and I just had to be by myself, and I I just left everyone, and I got into the bathroom, and I kneeled on the tile floor and prayed. It was much worse for the level kids at school. And everybody came up to me and said, I'm so sorry, your dad's going to die. April 14th, 21 hours after the explosion, the crippled ship rounded the far side of the moon. In the midst of this incredibly tense and stressful flight, where in, in many ways this crew was fighting for their lives, you got to see something you'd never seen before. What was that experience like? Uh, well, it, it was obviously, uh, to me, great to have the opportunity even just loop around the moon. Uh, Jack uh, and I did a lot of sightseeing as we went around the backside. Lovell, who had already circled the moon in Apollo 8, got a little impatient with all the photos his shipmates were taking. And I told him, if if we don't get back, you're not going to get them developed. You are basically running a bare-bones operation at that time. You are shutting down everything you can because everything aboard that module drains power. And you need all the power you can, you can save. Exactly right. And we had to turn off all the electrical systems, and that's when the temperature kept dropping. We'd like you to uh, go down that power down procedure. We knew it was going to get as cold as a meat locker inside that spacecraft. So in other words, you're saying, look, guys, you're going to be cold and thirsty and hungry for four days but you're going to go through that because if we do anything else, that you're not getting home. That's correct. So how cold did you get? It was about the temperature of your refrigerator. It got pretty miserable. We had uh, got out of storage all our spare underwear. So we had three sets of underwear on. What about food? How much food did you have? We didn't eat much food. Uh, And the water was freezing and the food was getting frozen too. Too cold to eat, too cold to sleep. I found out that I could be in front of the instrument panel, put my fingers together, close my eyes, and for about three minutes, be asleep. Wake up, refreshed. And so that's essentially the, actually the sleep that we got on the way home. April 15th, 30 hours after the explosion, something else threatened to kill them, something they couldn't even see. In layman's terms, your own exhalation. And the fact that the three of you, breathing out, were creating so much carbon dioxide that it was going to kill you. That, that's absolutely correct. 
Remember, the lunar module was only designed to support two men for two days. Its air purifiers were maxed out. The dead command module was still attached. They could get more filters there, but they were the wrong shape, square, and wouldn't fit the round openings in the LEM. And of course, it's a big engineering goof that we didn't have the same canister for both sides. We got to come up with a solution here. Engineers had to design an adapter, literally make a square peg fit in a round hole. They had to do it quickly, and they could only use what was on the spacecraft. Part of a flight manual, plastic bags, duct tape. They did a mock-up of it down on the ground in Houston, and then they told you basically how to do it, and you must have thought they were crazy. Yeah, they said, now take three feet of duct tape. And we said, what, three feet? They said, yeah, an arm's length of duct tape. <laughs> The strange-looking contraption worked. It saved their lives. And for two more days, cold, hungry, sleepless, the three astronauts hunkered down and willed their way home. At some point, Mission Control instructed you to stop sending your urine out of the spacecraft. And, and some people might think that's the ultimate indignity. These guys are in a tough enough strait as it is. What was the reason for that? Well, what they said was, we don't want any unbalanced force on the vehicles because we want to get you back in that free return course for a safe approach through the atmosphere and a landing on the so Earth. So when you expel urine... It would change the course a little bit. It's like a little rocket engine. So now you've got bags of urine floating around yeah, in, in, in the spacecraft as well. Yeah, let me try to, try to figure out where to put that. They all but stopped drinking water. Dehydration set in. Fred Hayes soon developed an infection and fever. That was all bad. But now, even as Earth loomed in the window, there was yet another crisis. They call up and said, we have extrapolated your course all the way back to the Earth and you're going to miss the atmosphere. You were by, drifting. Yeah, by 60 or 80 nautical miles, which meant, although they didn't say it, is that, hey, you're gone. Nearly four days after the crippling explosion, as Apollo 13, against all odds, seemed about to make it home, Mission Control discovered something potentially devastating. The spacecraft was drifting off the trajectory you wanted. The spacecraft was, was drifting off, the, and we didn't understand what was happening. Apollo 13 was going to come in too shallow, bounce off the Earth's atmosphere, and be lost forever. We have to perform another emergency maneuver. The engineers calculated the precise direction and amount of rocket thrust needed to correct the course. Then the crew had to make it happen, firing the rockets manually, steering by sighting the Earth and Moon through the windows. Nobody had ever done that before. This was a team effort, right? I mean, you're, you're handling one aspect, trying to keep the Earth from moving yeah. up and down. and Fred Hayes was going, you know, to keep it from going sideways. And of course, he's sick at this time. And Jack is timing it uh, because our clock had stopped, of course. Were you worried at all, Gene, that after all they had been through over those three or four days, the, the cold, the sleep deprivation, the tension and the stress, that they may just make a simple mistake, that they simply weren't up to the task of getting home? No, no. This is the kind of relationship that we must have with our crew. The crew totally depends upon us to come up with the right answers. We depend upon them to provide the information and to execute. So, so this, no relation, for second this guessing. relationship is absolute, absolute. A trust is really the key. Go for the burn. We're burning 40%. And the crew made the tricky maneuver like they'd done it a thousand times. I say that was a good burn. Friday, April 17th, just hours from Earth now, the astronauts needed to get back into the command module. It had been shut down, frozen for days. Engineers on the ground were working feverishly on a way to start it up again. Okay, system test uh, 1A. We went through four different versions of this checklist. We have a procedure for getting power from the lamp. It's not a very long procedure. And I got a little testy and I said, look it, give us the proper information. No more, no less. It was a critical time. Normally, the command module was powered up before launch, when electricity was unlimited. Never had a command module been shut down in flight, then restarted with just battery power. 
If the batteries died, so would the crew. And you talk about this procedure, over 500 steps. And they had to then radio those steps, and they had to be written down one after the other. We had no blank paper, so we had to rip covers and backs off of checklist and use that uh, to write this checklist, which was very lengthy. Now, checklist in hand, three cold, hungry, sleepless men had to execute it perfectly. Okay, uh, you're going to start uh, powering up the command module. Right now, we're starting now. The command module did come fully up, uh, you know, fully, fully powered up. Sigh of relief there. I mean, that's your, that's your ride home. It, it was a ride home, ready or not. Back in the command module now, less than five hours from Earth, the crew jettisoned the part of the spacecraft that exploded and nearly killed them all. Copy that. Service module separation at uh, 138 hours, uh, 2 minutes, 8 seconds. For the very first time, they could see just how bad the damage was. As it floated away, finally just in front of us, we saw that the entire panel had been blown out. And there's one whole side of that big uh, missile. Right by the high gate antenna, the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, base to the uh, engine. And that had to set off some fears in this room that that explosion also damaged the heat shield on the command module because they sit right next to each other. And would they be able to survive re-entry? In our line of business, you only worry about those things that you can do something about. So all the things you had done for the four days prior, all the heroic efforts of everyone would have been for naught had there been a major flaw in that heat shield. It just wouldn't have mattered. That's right. There's nothing we could do about it. Never could go outside to repair it or anything like that. So we just, we just took it for granted that the heat shield was going to be intact. Next, they jettisoned the LEM, their lifeboat, which they'd nicknamed Aquarius. It was time. Marilyn, you, you seem like a, a tough gal. Um, however, there had to be times when you went over in your mind how you would tell the kids if it didn't turn out well. Actually, I really don't believe I really thought about it because I really didn't give up. I just knew he'd be come back. It had been the moon mission people ignored. And now the whole world was watching. You couldn't breathe. <laughs> and we all just sat there and we just held our breath and we held it with the world. Apollo 13 plunged into the Earth's atmosphere on Friday, April 17th, after nearly six days in space. During re-entry, the 5,000 degree fireball surrounding the ship blacked out all radio transmissions. The crew is now on their own. There are no more givebacks. The blackout was expected to last four minutes. Standing by for any reports of acquisition. And there's no response. And we call again. It's now one minute since we should have heard from this crew. Apollo 13 should be uh, out of blackout at this time. Every controller in this room is standing staring at those clocks in the wall. One minute and 27 seconds after we should have heard from the crew, we get a ray of hope. Odyssey Houston, standing by, over. Okay, we read you, Jack. And the emotional release in this room is so intense that literally every controller is standing crying. Apollo 13 is practically on the time. But when that spacecraft splashed out and water came over the, over the windows, I said, hey, we're home. Were there handshakes in the capsule? Were there tears? What was going on in there? It was just quiet that we, 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 we shook each other's hand and we said, hey, we made it again. The capsule was still cold. Even after entry, uh, smoky air, frosty air poured out of the hatch when the, the diver uh, opened the hatch. And this crew that had been living in a meat locker is finally out in the warm air of the South Pacific and they are home and they are alive. What was the first thing you said to Marilyn when you got back to Earth? I said, you can't live without me. <laughs> you can't get rid of me that easy? That's right. <laughs> but here are the facts of Apollo 13. To this day, 40 years later, no human beings have ever ventured farther from home. 
And to this day, no astronauts have overcome so many disasters, large and small, to make it back alive.